Lovely. Let's go right to the main event, which is which is you and your experience <laughs> in this DEI space long before it was a buzzword, and then particularly in the relevance for Black History Month. So, you know, at, at the beginning of the month, um, on February 1st, we had a big kickoff uh, for Black History Month, as I, as I mentioned uh, just now in the introduction. But tell me a little bit in terms of, and tell us a little bit in terms of how has Black History Month evolved in general? but particularly in the corporate setting and they're in the public and private sector as well. Yeah, thank you. That's a great way to kick off this conversation because I think sometimes, especially when the word history is a part of this particular month celebration, Black History Month, Women's History Month, next month, for example, we can easily get caught into looking at the past only, sort of viewing culture, viewing progress, with a little bit of a rear view mirror lens. And I think it's so important that we really modernize and continue these conversations today. And so Black History Month started in the 1920s as one week. Um, and by 1976, President Ford made it by presidential proclamation a full month of celebration and recognition. All presidents um, after Ford have have renewed that commitment, renewed that proclamation, uh, which is so vital to not only the U.S. Uh, history, the U.S. culture, but today Black History Month is actually celebrated in Canada. And I think we have some Canadian colleagues here today, as well as Ireland and the U.K. And so in the U.S., it's kind of easy to get very narrowly focused on um, how we view diversity and inclusion in particular, but I do think it's important to highlight that Black History Month has evolved um, outside of the United States as well. But I wanna talk about the word history for just a moment and help us think about how we can modernize it and really bring it forward to the forefront. Because it's easy for us to say, okay, that's in the past. Why should I care about it today? Um, I, have a, I have a middle school daughter who unfortunately history is not her favorite subject. And so sometimes I get questioned as a mom, like, why do I have to study this? And as adults, we might wonder, why do we have to celebrate the past? Today, if you don't take anything from this conversation, I hope that you'll walk away not thinking of Black History Month as just that rear view mirror where we celebrate Dr. King only, but that we really think about how can we truly value the contributions of every single person. And I wanna give us an example, Thomas Edison. Most of us know that he uh, really perfected the invention of the light bulb. We use them uh, every single day, right? And before the invention of the electric light bulb, we had, you know, the gas lighting, and that was really the only way uh, to light uh, homes and businesses. And yet, while Thomas Edison was a pioneer, you know, just revolutionary in his inventions and contributions, not only to the United States, but literally to the world, there is an important African American inventor, Lewis Lattimore who actually built upon Edison's invention and perfected it. Because while Edison made great strides in the electric light bulb, what he invented didn't last long and it was extremely expensive. And so it would not have been usable in our everyday kind of residential homes until the contribution and the invention or perfection of Lewis Lattimore, an African-American inventor. So again, you might say, okay, Kelly, you're still sort of stuck in the past. How is this important to me today? I wanna to bring it fast forward to 2022. McKinsey and Lean In published a study called Women in the Workplace. And in that study, where thousands and thousands of individuals from around the world contributed to this study, what this study found is that actually Black and Asian women in particular were cited in this study as saying that they are rarely rarely recognized publicly for their contributions in the workplace. And so what we see is that Thomas Edison really gets all the fame and the highlights when it comes to the light bulb, not Lewis Latimer. And also in our workplaces today, we still have communities who, whose, value, whose contributions to organizations aren't always celebrated with an equitable lens in view. And so that's how Black history has evolved. That's why it's still relevant to all of us today. That recognition for them really leads us into this conversation around 
nourishing black talent within an organization, right? You just gave us a yeah. historical context in that example. But what are some ways that you've seen companies do this and how they've made it real? And why is it intentional? Uh, why is it important to be intentional about that? Yeah. So as you've mentioned, um, so Keras has worked with organizations, large and small global organizations for the past eight years on their diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives. So we really help organizations link their business initiatives and strategies to diversity, equity and inclusion, because at the end of the day, DEI is about innovation, driving growth, creating transformative growth for both individuals and organizations. And so developing talent is key. Um, and the first step, and one of the things that we often recommend to organizations is broad diversity, equity, and inclusion training to all employees. So we really want to make sure that uh, a, a diverse and inclusive mindset is a part of just the way we treat each other on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's also really, it branches out into the community, into our supplier partners um, and beyond. And so DEI training is the first step often. When it comes to uh, really, how do we develop diverse talent in particular, the reason why we want to start with DEI training as the foundation is because we ultimately want to create inclusive leaders. So a lot of times what we see in organizations, and it's not unique to any industry, we've worked with you know, banking, manufacturing, uh, retail, um, even the arts, we've, we've touched every sector I could probably imagine, uh, including the public sector around DEI. And what we often find is that people are usually promoted based on their contributions as an individual contributor as a part of that recognition, which is great. They are then promoted into management, but rarely do they receive training on how to be an effective manager or how to be an effective leader. And let alone, you know, how to be an effective inclusive leader, right? So that's like another level of really managing and developing and engaging teams. And so inclusive leadership training is also usually a, a, a recommendation in organizations just to build that leadership competency and capability. And then um, I would say mentoring programs are very common and, and popular to make sure that we are developing the next, uh, the next leaders in the organization. So how can someone, or what are some tangible ways that someone can be an ally to the black community, whether it's professionally, whether it's personally, right? Because we've had all this rich historical context. How can, how can individuals make it real? Yeah. I love that question. And allyship is often um, a really positive intention for most of us. At Keras, we really try to assume positive intent um, and that in general, people are good or they try to be good contributors, good citizens of the world. Um, but there's oftentimes we don't know what we don't know. And the best way to be an ally is to stay curious um, in a very respectful way. One of the things that I think can create a little bit of a slippery slope is that we often assume that our life experiences are the same for other people. And so the spaces that I may enter, the rooms that I may enter in, in corporate settings, in the community, oftentimes I may or may not always feel comfortable based on my own life experiences. And an ally really takes the time to understand, hey, I'm comfortable. I feel great. This is a great environment. It's welcoming to me. But have I stopped to consider that other people may not necessarily feel comfortable and that there might be reasons for that? Um, I, I was once told by an African-American young professional who was traveling um, to different parts of the United States, and they would go to very rural areas in the US, which are not known for having um, much visible diversity, especially racial and ethnic diversity. She was traveling with a manager who, um, who is white and they stopped at a, at a gas station, right? We all have to take breaks, you know, get a drink or whatever, but she didn't feel safe getting out of the car because she knew that this town did not have much racial diversity. And yet her manager, and the person that she was writing with wasn't aware. And so when we, when we really take the time to think about, hey, this is comfortable for me, 
but it may not be comfortable for some people. I think that is the best way to be an ally. Um, and I also think the other piece that I wanna really emphasize, because this is a bit of a pitfall to avoid as an ally, is to really make sure that we are taking ownership of our own education. When we ask marginalized communities to educate us on what they sh what we should know, we are adding to the emotional tax, the microaggressive trauma that marginalized communities experience every single day. And so the form of allyship that I really want to emphasize is own your personal development. Take the time to read articles, to listen to podcasts, check out different social media platforms of diverse communities to really kind of for a moment, walk or wheel yourself through someone else's shoes and life experiences um, so that you're participating actively in learning maybe what you may not already know. So I, I heard many things from what you you just you just said to us, Kelly. Um, stay curious in a respectful way. I also heard taking ownership of your own education, right? We, we, we talk about leadership development, but there's also this element of cultural competency that's also uh, necessary as a leader as well. So thinking through that is absolutely necessary. Can you give us some insight into the differences between um, allyship or similarities and then the sponsorship component and then also the mentorship component as well? I love this question. I'm so glad you picked back up on that, Amy. So I would say um, many of us are familiar with mentoring. It can be formal and informal. I've, I'm really fortunate and very grateful that I've had some amazing mentors in my career, and many of them didn't look like me um, and also had very different life experiences. And so I think, um, I think it's so important that we all stay open to learning from everyone, right? Even, you know, how many in the chat have had um, a not so great boss uh, that you learned something from, right? So I'm sure it never happened at Essity, but let's just say in the past, you worked for someone who was not a great boss or a great manager. Can I get some uh, feedback in the chat? Did you learn something even from challenging colleague uh, interactions or challenging manager interactions? And so, just know that mentoring is always happening, whether we intend for it to or not. Thank you for those who are participating. I love it. So I would say if you're a mentor, you're likely an ally as well, but you may not always be a sponsor. So a mentoring really takes their personal experiences, life and professional to really guide someone to give advice from their lens and their perspective. A, a mentor can open doors and create connections for others, which is a form of sponsorship. But the highest form or the, the maximum form of sponsorship is really using your influence, your voice and your power to advocate and create opportunities for others who may not be able to advocate for themselves or may not yet have the influence and power to really advance or accomplish whatever it is they're trying to accomplish. So hopefully all of us are allies. Um, and in many ways, many of us are often informal mentors. I'll, I'll share just a quick example of, of a mentoring partnership where my mentor, it was a formal uh, arrangement where that the company structured and he was a, I want to say he was a first generation Irish American. And he, uh, at first when we were matched together, there was a pretty significant age difference. And I thought, you know, he's from Ireland, like he, he's not even really from the U.S. Like, what are we going to have in common? I admired his leadership style. But I was a little cautious. I was cautiously optimistic. But but he was an amazing mentor to me. And one of the things that he did is he took the time to understand the Black experience in the U.S. And in one of our first meetings, he related it to the Irish immigrant experience. And so he took that first step to educate himself. He also took the step to find those connections and to really look for them. He didn't just approach our mentoring partnership as, you know, hey, if you want to get promoted, if you want to advance, you need to do this, this, and this, because this worked for me. 
that's typically not the ideal uh, way we want to structure mentoring, but to keep that curiosity, um, to take the time to build authentic relationships uh, both ways. It, it's both the mentee and the mentor's responsibility to do that, but I hope that gives some clarity on kind of the three levels of engagement or types of uh, partnerships that we can have. You, you pointed out some things that really resonated with me in terms of sponsorship and mentorship. Sometimes you may have a sponsor and not even know, right? Because they have positional power to where they're in rooms where you may not be, and they're advocating for you in that space and in that place. And, and also from the mentorship perspective, um, I will say from a mentorship and a sponsorship perspective, just because of positional power in the organizations that I was in, majority of them were white men. And it was absolutely, um, and still to this day, uh, keep in touch with all of them, mutually beneficial relationships. It was almost like a reverse mentoring that was taking place where, right, once you get past that that um, awkward, uh, you know, moment of getting to know each other for a few sessions, perhaps, um, you start understanding and being able to ask questions and have a level of comfort. So that way, some of those questions that may be deemed taboo would actually be helpful. I was actually watching something um, this past weekend. The NBA has, they had the All-Star Weekend last week and they have a tech summit. And one of the panels um, was a couple that you just would not think in terms of mentorship. And it was Bob Iger, who is the now, now again, CEO of the Walt Disney Company and Chris Paul, the basketball player. And he said, we got to know each other through the Clippers and, and, and you know, just made a curious interest, kind of going back to what you were mentioning about being curious and they've built a relationship that has uh, that has transcended sports, but also into business, into family and things of that nature. And so seeing that and seeing that partnership was really powerful for that information exchange, for that knowledge exchange. And Bob was also speaking about how much he learned about, about not only the Black experience, but also um, in 2020 um, with the murder of George Floyd and when everything erupted right, how he was able to understand the context so much better because he had taken on that personal education that you mentioned earlier, Kelly. Absolutely. That's such a great story. And I think, you know, it's, I do want to emphasize reciprocity, right, that it is the responsibility of all of us to build relationships. There's community and spaces that I, I don't know their experiences personally. So I really try to um, handle with care um, experiences or topics or situations where maybe I don't personally identify with um, that particular community, just out of honor and respect to individuals. And I think if we approach it respectfully um, and even um, kind of acknowledge, hey, you know, I, I, I really want to be supportive or I want to be honoring in this moment, but I'm not sure, right? So really just putting it out there that I'm approaching this conversation. I may, I may stumble accidentally because I just don't know, but I want you to know where I'm coming from. I want you to know my intentions are positive, um, but let's extend grace or let's ask for grace and let's make sure that we're reciprocating. Absolutely. Reciprocity is key. One question that comes to mind is, uh, there's a statement, I'm not sure who it's sourced from, but, you know, you can be what you see, or it's, it's some, something to that extent, right? Where when, when you see something, it's much more tangible. When you see something visually, it's much more tangible in your mind that you can achieve it, right? And so what guidance do you have for Black talent, whether it's within ESSITY, whether it's within organizations, other organizations, whether it's just in general, where you may not see someone who looks like you sitting in those positions of power yet, right? Well, what, what guidance do, do you give to individuals? Love that question in this conversation. So, you know, I've often mentored and coached um, people from a variety of backgrounds, but there's a common theme that I often hear from um, Black talent in particular, and that is I'm considered a high performer, I'm actually often training the people who are new to my department, but yet I'm not promoted. I, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard that similar situation, I, I probably would be, you know, independently wealthy at this point. Um, and so I think that there's a couple of things. Sometimes 
we may not see what we can be inside of our organizations. And so expanding our networks outside of the organization is going to be really important. Um, earlier, I talked about owning your own education. Well, as Black professionals, we have to own our development as well. We have to take the responsibility to invest in ourselves, whether that's education, certifications, or just building community and expanding our networks. And I'm a big fan of when building relationships outside of the organization and inside as well. But you know, try to be the giver first. Uh, be a go giver. There's a book with that title, I believe, but, you know, be a giver first before asking to receive um, and find ways that you can authentically contribute to someone else. Um, and so through that, you can often receive more than what you even expected. I would also say um, make sure that you build cross cross uh, cultural relationships in the organization. So just because you don't see someone who looks like you in leadership, I believe that it's a great opportunity to connect with others who, you know, maybe you can relate to the fact that I'm, I'm taking care of a parent right now and I heard that this executive is doing the same thing. I am a working parent right now and there is another person who's in senior leadership in Somehow they're balancing family and career. I'd love to learn. So try to find commonalities that may not necessarily be about our racial identity, our gender identity, but take the time to, to really stay open to what you can learn from others. And then the last piece of advice, it kind of goes back to the question of why am I not getting promoted? My advice here is to make sure that we are um, positioning ourselves in a way that we are coachable, that we are mentorable. If we are uh, defensive when we receive feedback that's less than favorable, um, it, it's going to be hard to get the information that you need to fine tune how you're showing up in the organization. So oftentimes we're looking for people to give us the mentoring, give us the advice, give us the sponsorship. But we also have to make sure that we stay open to feedback, even if we disagree with it in the moment, even if it's painful in the moment. Try to see if there's just a little grain of truth to what they might be saying, because if one person has that perception, it could it could be that others do as well. So we want to check in with multiple sources to try to really find where are those potential areas of development that I just it's it's out of my peripheral view. I didn't notice this about myself. I didn't know, I wasn't trying to show up this way, but this is how I am presenting. When we're talking about talent and talent reviews, and you know, this can be for someone who is a, a manager of people, um, you know, what are some ways that that conversation can be happening year round? So that way, when we talk about the coachable, the coachable piece, promoting within the organization, that it's not just relegated to the talent review season. But is that a way that that managers can be allies throughout the year as well? Yes, I'm so glad you asked that question. So here's some quick advice for all the people leaders out there and aspiring people leaders. When you have one-on-one -on -one meetings with your team members um, to check in on projects or how are we doing on this particular initiative, carve out space to just talk about them. Talk about their life, talk about their goals and aspirations, um, If and make it a point to routinely do that. Uh, put it in your calendar or use your smartphone uh, to give yourself a pop-up reminder. And what is your commitment? Once a month or is it quarterly? But create a cadence to um, make sure that you're checking in with your team members about how they're doing personally to the degree that they feel comfortable sharing, but to also find out, hey, how is this work, this big project that you're on right now, how is that aligning with your long-term goals? And talk about, hey, here's some things that I see in you. These are some skill sets that I see. I don't know if you recognize it, but these are things that I'm noticing. How does that tie into kind of what you think about yourself and, and what you think that you might wanna do in the future? And so 
some some members of your team might need a little bit of time to think about that. So uh, if you have introverts on your team, for example, I would encourage you to give them a little bit of a prompt before the meeting so that they can expect that question, especially if that is a question that you have typically only asked once a year during the performance review time. So if this is something new, I would prep your team. Um, and even if they're not introverts, I still think it's a good idea to, to be overt about your intentions as a people leader, uh, to really make it known, hey, I care about your development and I see great things for you. So let me know how I can support you in that. Um, as people leaders, oftentimes we feel like we have to have all the answers, but I wanna encourage us to ask, hey, what kind of support do you need from me? Or how can I help you in that way? Um, because sometimes with our good intentions, we're doing things, we're saying things, we're saying, hey, go attend this and go attend that meeting, but it really doesn't align with what the person wants to pursue. So good intentions, but we wanna make sure that they're aligned with what the person is most interested in. This is something that if you are a black professional where it may just uh, burden you to where you may not want to share what examples of that looks like or feels like because you may be the only one. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can can walk us through some examples of how microaggressions or emotional tax shows up in the workplace. Um, because I know certainly it can it can uh, manifest itself in different ways. I'll give a very, very quick example. I'll be very vulnerable right now. I've shared this with the with the courageous conversations facilitators. Right now, my hair is slicked back. It's straight, um, but i I have uh, thick, kinky hair, and which is beautiful because it's versatile. But also, there is a perception, and there's been a perception in corporate America that natural hair, um, isn't professional, right? And so uh, early in, in my career, I would intentionally hide the fact and not 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 wear my hair out. And I remember there was one day where I was intentional about, all right, I did my my two strand twists and I, you know, put my roll on it and I put it out, you know, for the day. And I was in a meeting and this was from a positional power perspective. He he ran the office that I was sitting in. And um, he went in and, and he, he compared my hair to his golden doodle, to his dog. And um, whenever I'm being vulnerable with individuals, um, and this is more than one individual, there's over 200 of you all on this call. Um, but what that did to me in terms of how I was put on the spot to respond, how I chose to navigate my hair choices in the future, right? It had an impact that necessarily that individual or maybe even that group didn't recognize. Um, thankfully, there was someone who was an ally in the room who kind of said, that's 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 not funny. Why would you even make that comparison? It doesn't make sense. Um, but kind of building on that, can you talk a little about a little bit about emotional tax um, and just microaggressions for black professionals in the workplace as well? Yeah, yeah, and I'm sorry you had to go through that, Amy. I'm wearing my hair natural today, um, so I can totally relate to your story and having comments. I mean, as I was listening to your story, I was trying to think, I think one of my earliest memories of someone commenting on my hair was probably seventh grade. Um, and, you know, it's so I think for those who aren't a part of the Black community, just know that comments about our hair or the way that we talk or whatever it might be, it's likely happened decades, decades before we enter the workplace. And with that, what I what I what resonates with me right now that I just want to highlight and share is the 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 years of being questioned about how you look, who you are, how you talk, um, how you carry yourself those years of dealing with that from youth, for many of us, we carry it. We carry the work, the burden and the fatigue as we enter the workplace. And so for me, I showed up very guarded when I entered corporate America and I was very reserved. Now that's part of just my natural personality, but it's all, it also stems from really trying to create protection. I'm trying to self protect. Let's build up some walls to make sure that I'm not hurt too much. And 
just to take it for a moment outside of kind of racial and ethnic diversity, I want to speak to those of us who came from under underprivileged socioeconomic backgrounds like I did. And so for me, it's not just about my my gender, my racial identity, uh, but for me, it was also about my socioeconomic status. And you know, as a leader, I was often the youngest leader uh, sitting around, you know, the boardroom, literally. Um, and I'll just touch on the socioeconomic part. There's a lot of shame that I carried because of, you know, hiding maybe what I did or didn't have to eat when I was in school. And so I learned to really hide and cover so much of who I am. And so even if you're not covering about your racial identity or your gender, maybe you're covering aspects of who you love. Maybe you're covering your financial circumstances. Maybe you didn't grow up in the, the better area of town. Whatever it is that maybe causes you to hesitate on truly sharing who you really are, we carry that into every single experience and interaction. And if if we didn't personally experience that level of, of shame or hesitation or insecurity, we may not always be able to relate to other people who did. And that's why I think this, you know, what may seem like a harmless air quote comment or joke, I think it's important that when microaggressions occur, they are amplified exponentially because those individuals have dealt with it likely their entire life. Kelly, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a, a personal story um, from your ascent in corporate America before starting your own uh, consulting firm. I just want to share that all of us have the power to transform our work environments and ultimately the world. And so one quick example that comes to mind is I was in a senior manager role and the director position, uh, the director of corporate comm role was available and it had been for a while. And because the position had been vacant for a while, I had pretty much taken on the work of both the director position and my senior manager position. And one day a friend, a coworker, uh, he's first generation immigrant from Guatemala, uh, we were buddies and we hung out a lot, um, especially at work. And um, he said, Kelly, why aren't you applying for the director role? And I was like, no way. I, I don't want that job. It's too much stress. At the time, I think I had recently had our son. And so I was a relatively newish mom. And I, I just didn't think that I could handle the stress of the director position and balancing um, kind of work life and, and being a, a new mom. And so he kept asking, he kept asking. And I, I kept sort of dismissing the idea, kept sort of running away from it. And then finally, one day after several conversations, he said, but you're already doing the job. You're just not getting the recognition for it or the title or the, or the increase. And that really stuck with me. You know, so I appreciate his persistence and I appreciate his perspective. Um, he didn't know necessarily what it was like to be a new mom um, in a corporate career, um, but he was a father. Right. And he saw how I was already contributing to the organization and taking on these additional responsibilities. And so I share that to say, you don't have to look like the other person. You don't have to have their same lived experiences, but you can always help someone sort of see maybe what they're not seeing in themselves. So hope that hope that resonates. We have one question. What were some hiring practices that you implemented or supported to increase the pool of uh, POC candidates, so people of color candidates? And then the follow-up question is, is Essity willing to try such practices? So you can take that first portion of hiring practice, practices that you implemented or perhaps that a client of yours implemented or supported to increase the pool of uh, people of color. Yeah. So one of the easiest ways to increase um, kind of the candidate slate in recruiting is to really market and make sure all employees are aware of the referral program if you have one. So mm -hmm. recommending people to the organization. Um, I was once a part of an organization that had had an employee referral program for years. 
but no one really knew where the form was and no one knew how to kind of make the referral. And unfortunately, the, the HR team had uh, kind of created a reputation inadvertently, not intentionally, but a reputation had formed that um, re referrals from people of color were not really acted upon that they they may refer someone who has amazing credentials on paper, but they wouldn't even get like a phone call or an email. And so some of this, um, some of my recommendations to the organization was to, hey, let's review the policies and the, the processes that happen with referrals that are made. The program was created by people who weren't even with the organization anymore. So you had a lot of you know people that weren't as familiar in HR with how do I even know that this was a referral being made? So I think our you know your current people are always a great way to um, expand the candidate slate of your uh, new openings that you might have. Another thing that I'm that we work with organizations on is really building an attract strategy that's very holistic around DEI. And we often recommend really creating strategic partnerships in the community that are tied to your industry, that are tied to those critical positions in your organization and making sure that you're partnering with either universities, sometimes even high schools, as well as professional associations to build that pipeline of candidates before you need them, before the, the opening is actually available so that you're cultivating these authentic and rich relationships with diverse associations, diver universities that have uh, diverse populations so that the, the candidate pool more organically comes to the organization. So those are just a quick, a couple of quick examples. Kelly, thank you for that insight. For the employee referral, I, I wrote that down uh, to, to go back for, for ours um, as well. And then let me see, I believe we had one more. Uh, do you have any suggestions on encouraging more people of color to get on the board um, for different organizations? Love that, that's a great way to develop. Um, my advice is, there is likely a nonprofit organization that would love to have your talents and skills. So is there a cause that you're passionate about that you could volunteer your time um, in sort of a board level uh, opportunity and to maybe start small, right? So if you're new to a board uh, position, maybe start a little small. And then as you gain that experience, you can contribute to maybe you start at a city level, then maybe uh, a state, or and or eventually national level um, with board participation in particular with nonprofits um, so that over time you could uh, potentially uh, leverage that experience into other uh, advisory capacities, whether it's a for profit or a nonprofit organization. But I think that's a great way to get perspective on a strategic level that you may not always have the opportunity to within your current role in the organization. It's also a great way to build relationships across different industries and uh, different uh, professional sectors. So if you're in finance, you're likely going to be a, a fellow board member colleague with people who are marketing professionals, with people who are HR professionals or who are lawyers. And so there's often diversity of skill sets and professional backgrounds that are a part of boards. So you probably heard undertones of us of, of me talking about care earlier, um, extending grace to others. That is core to our values as a firm, both internally and in partnership with our clients. We have tough conversations as we need to, but just know that we are always going to come from a place of forward movement, trying to make progress together. Um, our mission, our purpose as Karis is to light the world, to create transformative growth. 